Um, if you guys have any questions, please do submit those. And while we're doing that, I'm going to transfer over so that we can begin the uh, live demonstration portion of this. Okay, so if there's any questions, go ahead and get those in. It looks like we did have a couple that came in uh, during that presentation. Um, it's, so the first question is from Becky. Um, it says, can SCP back up to an HP RDX drive cartridge? And yes, the answer is yes. Um, we definitely can. Again, any type of media that is recognized by your operating system, we can back up to. So it can be disc, it can be tape, it can be, you know, anything from an LTO1 to an LTO5, anything from, you know, one tape slot up to several thousand in a large tape library. Um, so yes, it, it is fully supported. Um, okay, another question uh, just came in. Again, uh, compatibility with um, some HP hardware from Jennifer. Um, yeah, that should be absolutely fine. Um, we, we fully support all the HP products, and um, yeah, I don't see any, any issues with that at all. Um, one second while I read the next question. Um, okay, so the next question is, uh, with virtual machines, can I do an image level backup of the C drive only and get larger data volumes another way? And the answer is yes, you can do that. Uh, that came from Drew. So yes, Drew, you can. That is possible. Uh, Christian, do you want to elaborate on that at all? Well, that's fine. You can do that, of course. Um, okay. I will show you that in the live presentation later. Okay. Um, and then next question um, says, I'm running backup exec on Windows 2008 server with Linux remote agents. Um, is this how SEP will work? Uh, yeah, we can run in that environment. That's fine. You can put the main backup server on Windows 2008, no problem. Um, and then you can also, um, you know, use remote Linux agents as well. Um, the other option you have is if you have a large Linux environment, then you would be able to, um, you know, basically run it on Linux if you wanted to. Um, you're more than welcome to keep it on Windows and. And what we generally recommend is run it on whatever operating system you're most comfortable with. So if you're more comfortable with Windows, keep it on Windows. If you'd like to switch it over and run it on Linux so that everything's, you know, it's running on Linux and you're backing up a lot of Linux clients, then that's no problem at all. Um, next question coming in is, will FTP set retention flags on backed up emails in GroupWise? Um, Christian, I'm going to defer that one to you. I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, me neither, but <laughs> I don't think so, because what we get over our new um, interface is the whole mailbox. So what you can do is you can save the mailbox on a special media pool and put a retention time on the media pool. So you have a, you know, kind of a retention time on every email in this backup. Okay, great. Uh, did that answer? I hope that answered your question, um, Ian. And, and if not, um, please please ask us another question. <laughs> um, the other thing I also wanted to mention too is um, we're more than happy to follow up with with you guys individually. Um, you know, if you guys do want to see what you know exactly what the capabilities are in your environment and and kind of do a test, um, you know. Contact us. Let me know. I'm more than happy to schedule some time with with you know each each and every one of you guys if you'd like to set up some proof of concepts um, to just kind of help you guys get started. Maybe point you in the right direction for some um, documentation, some quick installation guides, so you can see what everything looks like. Um, and we're more than happy to work with you so that you guys can actually get a little test going. You know, and compare the differences and, and compare the speed see how much quicker your backups are, uh, see what kind of functionality we offer and all of that. And, and we're more than happy to help you guys get started. Um, one last question I have before we jump into this. Um, it says, will I be able to do full backups uh, once a week with uh, differential on the other days? And the answer is yes, you'll definitely be able to do that. Uh, 
you will have differential or incremental options. Um, and, and that's kind of the most common backup scenario that we recommend is doing full backups on the weekends and then daily incrementals, um, you know, and then theoretically migrating those to an offsite location as well. So uh, we are going to jump into the live demo portion. We will please continue to ask questions as we go through. I'll, I'll kind of um, be monitoring those while Christian's going through the uh, live demo portion. And then again, at the end, we'll answer any questions that you guys have also. So Christian, I will turn it over to you. Well, uh, Lena, I thank you for the great introduction. Um, so what I can do for you now is to give you uh, yeah, a very a quick and a good overview of the product, Sepsism, and um, I will start with, with the way how you can do the installation. Option number one is you select the operating system, you know, which feels comfortable for you, Windows, Linux, Debian, something else, or you keep things much easier and download the appliance. The appliance is an ISO image what comes with the SLES 11 with a prepared database and with the latest version of the SEPSISM server and just burn the CD and, and install it on your server or start for tests a virtual system. You can also run the SEP server in a, um, in a virtual environment if you want, but for high performance we recommend a physical box. And yeah, this installation takes approx I think two or three minutes and then the, then yeah, we have a perfect prepared SEP season server. This here, what you see is the graphic user interface. Um, as I told you, it's, it's written in Java, so you can start it on pretty much every operating system. I installed it on a Windows 7 box, and um, it's, it's totally equal to all the other operating systems. This is an important message for you. And the configuration um, starts here at the top level. Components topology. Very easy. What you can do here is build little houses called new locations that you and your colleagues, or better said, the administrator, have an overview which server or which client is, for example, here, um, uh, level one. Okay, level one. We have here, you know, a group below Citrix Sen, and then you can add a new client to level one. Add a new client is you install on a system from what you from which you want to have a backup the agent and after you install the agent you click on new client enter the host name here a host name for example is you know I just type in host name very easy select the main platform so um, a Linux system or OES is Unix and then you can go here more in detail and select ESX server Citrix and um, or Mac OS X, OAS Linux, this is what you can do here, and then just agree with OK. So, and I think these steps take a couple of minutes. You can also do it when you have to add more than, I don't know, 100 clients. You can start all these commands on the command line if you want. You don't have to, but you can, um, like an automatic installation script. And um, yeah, this is what I did. I prepared a little environment. I, I installed a VMware workstation. And on this VMware workstation, I have my SEPSISM server running, a ESX um, 5 host with a virtual machine inside. OK, this is what you can see here. This is the Windows 7. Um, the other systems I have is a fresh installed OES 11 with a group wise, with NSS volumes, with iPhone, with everything prepared for this demonstration. Um, and here a Windows box with, you know, the console one and the group wise agent. Here I have, uh, you know, a regular Windows system 2008 R2. Um, I use that here as a DNS server and for my Active Directory. And what I also have is a Xen server. Um, I will go with you through the main installation points, what you have to do. Step number one, this is what we already did, add all the clients to your backup server, okay? Um, the only information what you have to know when you connect to a, a network system is that when you select OES Linux, you will see here a new tab. In this tab, you have to type in the account and the password to uh, talk to the TSA agents on the system. 
Okay, that's the only thing what you have to do. The data mover, the data mover is a, a very cool thing because you can also do land free backup. So that means if you attach a sand storage directly to your OES 11 box, then you can transfer the backup directly to the sand. So you don't have to use your, your wire for, you know, your big data transfer. That's the reason why we have the data mover here, like a, yeah, a, data stream translator or a data mover. Yeah, that's the reason why I call data mover. And um, here, ESX is also very easy. Um, you select operating system, ESX server, and then a new tab pops up and you just type in the account to connect your ESX server. The data mover here is a system where your storage is. You know, um, the best situation would be that um, this host has connect to the same SAN storage as the ESX data stores. Because in this case, we can do a land-free SAN snapshot backup of all your VMs. And another cool feature, what will come out in the next releases, when you choose an NFS share as, a, as the SAP season backup location, you can mount VMs out of the backup. So there is no downtime. Just an example, you, you recognize the start of your ESX service card for any reason. What you have to do is you connect over the vCenter to the same NFS share as SAP Sesam does and um, add this as a ESX data store. And then you can browse all the VNs from the backup and start it. And this keeps downtime, you know, in, in, in minutes maximum. Okay, step number two, data stores. This is, this is a position where you can choose the disk on which you want to make your backup. You can use sand storage, you can use iSCSI, you can use NFS, you can use a, a USB drive if you want. You know, that maybe doesn't make that much sense, but sometimes we have co-locations, very small co-locations, um, where you just want to have a local file backup. So when you don't want to spend that much money, buy a cheap drive, and attach it to the SEP season. The next thing what we have is a remote device server. A remote device server is pretty much, um, or has pretty much the same functionality like the SEP season server, but without a database. So when you have an environment with one main SEP season server and some co-locations, you install one SEP season server and on the co-locations only the remote device server. So you can manage all the offices from this one subsystem server, and you can decide if you want to leave the data at the co-location or you want to migrate it to the main location so that you're always in the position to recover a co-location in your main location. This is very important. And um, a new technology, what we bring out in a future release, um, the DDoP technology, um, we call it at the moment set by three store, this will offer you a technology with which you can deduplicate all your files and after deduplication you can do a block level replication to your offsite location. Okay? We also um, want to support um, moving um, this files into the cloud. So you can, I think that that will happen at the end of the year. You can choose as a data store, for example, uh, Amazon storage or any cloud storage, okay? At the moment, we have a remote device server for Amazon, um, but um, this um, comes with our regular remote device server, okay? I will show you how easy it is to, to just add your local disk as a data store. Let's call the name, um, let's say the name, local um, data store, back store type path, this is um, what I will explain you later at the SAP Easy Archive. Step number two is um, choose here the server on, on which the storage is attached. This is what I thought, um, this is what I ex tried to explain you when you when you have a storage on a second server. The only thing what you have to do is ins install a remote device server, select this remote device server, and then you can use this box as your data storage. I choose here my local box, select the temp directory, he tells you how much space is left and 
some things, you know, what you can adjust with capacity maximum that you never, you know, um, get um, out of space on your disk and stuff like that. You can create a new disk drive group. Um, the feature what we have inside here with the disk drive group is when you have five different disks, okay, let's say five two terabyte disks, then you can add one data store, add all these five different drives to this one data store, and he balance the files between these five drives. So you can add always more and more drives into the one data store in case you see there is, you know, you run maybe out of space. This is what you can do with drive group. Maximum channels. Um, this is one of our important features, the um, multi-streaming technology. Right in this position here, you can choose how or how many parallel streams you want to write to this disk. It starts with five and it ends, you know, with, I don't know, there is, you know, there is pretty much no limit. The only limit what you have here is your environment. So when you have a very fast network technology or um, a very fast SAN technology, you can rise um, the, the channels up to, you know, to 100 or 200 streams. This also depends on the SEP season version you buy. When you buy a standard server, when you buy advanced server, you get more and more power streams, okay? Just accept that with okay. Um, he asked you for creating a new media pool. Um, the media pool is now the logical name for you. You can call this media pool, for example, weekly backup. So, you know, when you start a backup later on this media pool, the retention time of the files you write on this pool is, let's say, five days. Okay? You can also add some, another media pool. Let's say I go back to my data store, jump into my local data store areas, create a new pool with the name monthly and the retention time for all files. What I, you know, write on this media pool is, let's say, 30 days. Okay, so you have a very, a very um, efficient way to to um, yeah to add different retention times for your data. Um, the next step, tape libraries. Very easy. What you have to do is buy a tape library, attach or yeah install it on the server, and then you can click here on new loader, type in the SCSI ID, the device server. The device server is again the system where the um, tape library is attached. Um, you can, with this feature here, you can, you know, you can leave the data here, for example, directly on the Windows 2008, because when you know this Windows machine has more than, I don't know, 50 or 100 terabytes of data, you can do a land-free data transfer if you choose the device server here, because then he reads the data from the Windows 2008 server and writes it directly to the tape, okay? And um, when you install the tape library before you install the Sepsism server. He will install everything automatically for you, okay? There's nothing to do for you. The fourth possibility what you have are drives. You can install here single tape drives, single RDX cartridges. You can install here also, um, you know, um, five USB drives. For example, your wishes to change Disk drives, you can set up here a new drive group. Let's call it, yeah, let's call it REX. Install a new drive. Here we have um, RDX is a disk hard, okay? And then just save it. Here you can also adjust the parallel streams, what you want to run for this drive. And that's it. That's the way to install RDX cartridge, okay? You see, he adds a new drive into your Sepsism server, and yeah, everything is prepared for a backup. Media pool, this is what we did before. Here's the monthly one, here's the weekly one, and um, you can do the same for tape backup, okay? You can call it um, tape pool 
week, retention time, I don't know, let's do again six days, and you can add, oh, sorry, description, um, weekly, tape, drive group, tape drives, okay? And then the next thing would be um, uh, tape, monthly, and so on, okay? Um, again, drive tape drives, retention time, let's say 30 days, and um, agree with OK. What you can do now is you can do or you can start a backup on your disk and migrate it to tape. So um, what we prefer is that you run all your backups first to disk storage and during the day or after the backup, migrate everything to a tape. So you have a double security. You can, you have um, a, a very, maybe a very fast disk what you can use for the initial restore. And in case something happens to this, you can run the restore directly from the tape. There is no reason to um, first copy the files back from the tape to a disk and then restore it to your system. You can do a direct restore from tape to your system. Okay, media, this is an overview for your physical tape medias. Here you see the label, barcode, is it right protected or not? And um, you also see here um, the pool and the, the occupancy, okay, that you know how much space is left on the tapes. This is everything, this is, I, I, I call it the, the main, the ground installation, okay? When this is, you know, when this is good, you can jump directly to tasks by clients. Tasks by clients is nothing else than Add tasks to all the clients what you added here in the top level, components topology. Let's see what we can do here for a Windows computer, okay? This is a Windows 2008 computer. Um, we have it right here, okay? And what we see on this computer is uh, a C drive and an E drive, okay? When I do a right click on this computer and say new backup task, I can enter here a task name. I can also select here the backup type. Let me see what we have, okay? It starts with DB2, Exchange, Exchange 2003. Here you can see everything what we are able to do on the Windows side. MSQL, Oracle, MaxDB, SAP, SharePoint, SharePoint sites, and so on. What I what I do for, for a pretty easy file backup is I select Path Backup, and instead of type in task name and type in the source memory. I browse on this system, into this system, sorry. And after a while, um, I should see here uh, overview of all my disks. I see here the system recovery. The system recovery includes Active Directory, the Windows configuration, your DNS configuration, and you can also select your C drive and your D drive or just the C drive. Click on OK. Here you have the option to say backup with virtual shadow copy or without. We prefer with virtual shadow copy because this offers you a 100% consistent backup. So when on this system uh, is a open Excel sheet or an open Word document, that doesn't matter because when we start the backup, we get a 100% consistent copy of this file and put it into your, in our backup stream. Okay? When you disable this function, you get a warning here and you will have, you know, like in the past, open files, part of the registry is open. And that's the reason why we only work with virtual shadow writers now. Okay? Very easy. Say okay. And then we see this task here. What you can do now is do right click, go to immediate start, and say, I want to do a full backup. You see here also the option to do a differential or incremental backup. But before you can run these two types, you have to do a full backup, okay? This is the only thing what you have to take care. And then you select the media pool, okay? In case um, you want to write it directly to a data pool, you can select the data pool and say, okay, when we want to start it to a test pool, this is also my local disk. I select the test pool here, agree with okay. And after a couple of seconds, I should see here, yes. I hope you can see that here, drive one, execute of a backup job. 
we have a better view for that because when we go to job state um, backups, we see here all activities on the backup server. Here you see um, a backup task, system recovery with the information. I, um, here's a C drive job from a Windows box, which I canceled manually so that you see how, the, how it looks when you cancel something manually. This is um, a backup of an ESX VM. Okay, this is still active. And the backup job of a Windows computer from the C drive is also active. Okay, I can do a double click on this task, jump into the main log, and see what's going on. Ah, cool. He He's still starting a shadow copy of the C drive so that we really have a consistent state. Okay? Yeah, this is task by clients. What you should do for a Windows... And Chris, yeah? I, I just wanted to jump in really quick. That, that's actually something that I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from a lot of people on that. Um, just that you can actually open the tasks while they're happening and you can see the exact status of everything in real time. Um, and and one, one customer kind of explained it as like just having a single pane of glass to be able to see your entire backup infrastructure. And he said, you know, with previous solutions that he had had, it was really hard to figure out what was going on at any one given time. He knew that his backups were running but he didn't know where they were, or how long they had left, what they were doing. He'd just basically have to wait until the whole thing finished and see if it was successful or not. Um, so I, I've gotten some pretty good feedback from that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The next thing I want to show you is uh, OES 11 box, okay? I told you I prepared a system with a group-wise 2012. Um, we brought out this client, other, I don't know, Lenai, um, when we brought out the, the agent for group by 2012. Um, um, a couple of months ago, I think. Yeah, and uh, it, it's cool. The only thing you have to do as well here is click on your backup task, browse into your system, and then you see here <laughs> the Linux part, and here on the top level, the, the yeah, we call it the Novell part. He tells you, hey, there's a group wise installed. Hey, we have a NSS file system. Hey, I found the e directory here. I found the OES um, i folder here. And, you know, and, and this is pretty cool because you can browse inside the uh, i folder if you want. Um, I just added a couple of guys here CR, that's, that's my um, nickname. And there's another user. I select this user agree with OK. He changed everything automatically, you know, backup type I folder. He, yeah, he selects the right source. I agree with OK. And da -da, I have a I folder backup job, OK? And then I can say immediate start, full backup on my, I don't know, let's put it here on my data pool. Backup started. I jump back here to my um, job state view and you see here after a second um, the active job pops up and yeah and tells me the job is successful wow so um, we can start a restore here right here just right click restore he asks you again is this a job you've chosen oh, of course here he tells you how much different versions of this task you have but we only did one so we have only this one Go to next, browse into this I folder, and um, I have only one document in my I folder at the moment. So select this document, say next, and here he asks you what do you want to do. You want to restore it to the original target path, or you want to restore it to a new target? Um, let's say restore it to a new target. I select here. Um, let me see if I can put it here into my colleagues folder. Yes, and say to not override existing files and start. Yeah, and what I have here is job state restore, so I can check all my restores here. And he tells me that this restore job is in the queue at the moment. Yeah, that's true, because uh, on both drives I have backup job running, but this is not a big deal, because what you can do is I can just add a second drive on my disk storage, and then I can run backups and restores at the same time, okay? 
pretty cool feature. Next part, tests by groups. We use the groups, you know, for, um, you know, for perfect harmony uh, in your um, in your backup environment. Uh, a good example is we split all your tasks in groups like file. Put in here the file task. You can put in here thousands of tasks. That doesn't matter. You can adjust the priority in um, putting tasks to the top level. So, for example, I put this task to the top level. I know this task will start first. Okay, and on the bottom you have the lower priority tasks. Second group is system. Okay, a system group includes for me, um, let's say I do a new backup task for my Windows box. Takes a little while. Do we do? Yeah, the system recovery. This is what I what I see as my system backup from from this Windows box. Hey, Christian, I'm going to ask uh, yeah. a couple of questions while we're waiting here. This is a perfect Of course. So, um, one question was, let me see. Um, it was in in regards to a loader on a SAM, and it says we have a loader on the SAM. Uh, the loader and drives have one alias. If using a data mover on the VMs. Do I zone each host and then connect raw devices to the VM, or how is it done? Um, when you when you work with raw devices, what you should do is you should install an agent inside the VM, and then um, install the drive from your tape library to the vCenter server. Because when you do that, you can do kind of a of a land free backup because then the data streams only happens internally. Okay, um, you can also when your tape library is able to um, to work with iSCSI, you can also install inside the VM a remote device and attach the tape drive as an iSCSI drive inside the VM with the raw device, and then the traffic also runs just internally. Okay, this is a, a pretty a little special with raw devices because you cannot do a snapshot of a raw device, but with our technology, you can do, you know, something like a land free backup. Okay, when you have a VM with virtual drives, you can um, just add the tape library to the computer with um, to the Sepsism server or to the remote device server, and then we do a SAN snapshot and transfer the data over your um, SAN directly to the tip. These are the two, two options what you have. Perfect. And we do have some other questions, but I'll let you continue here and then we can we can jump in in a minute. Perfect. Very quick. Uh, I added the group system and I put in here my system recovery task. For a Noel client, um, I just add you very quick um, my e directory backup. I hope I prepared my TSA for e directory. Um, just say here um, OES 11 e directory, select e directory with the source all. Okay. And then I can add this task to a group system. So a third group is VMs, virtual systems. Okay. Um, no, sorry. I want to add a group, not a task. VMs. Put in here. This is, this is, oh, this is what I forgotten to show you how that looks like when you browse um, an ESX environment. I have a second system here, um, which shows you what kind of environment you can back up with Sepsism. Um, let me say vSphere. I installed my Sepsism client on the virtual center server because the virtual center is able to tell me exactly which VM runs on which node. So 
That means I don't have to take care on how many nodes I have and which storage I connect to my nodes. The only thing I, I did was install the client on the virtual center server. And I will show you how that looks. The virtual center server is a Windows or a Linux. I have a Windows virtual center. You can also use or work with a Linux um, virtual center. It doesn't matter. It's pretty much the same. Here you see um, the, the cluster group. Below the cluster group, um, I have my, my nodes. Takes a while, and here you see, you know, this is, this is you know, just a little, little QA environment of the SCP. And, and what I have to do is, yeah, select the VMs, agree with OK. And a cool feature is I can enable here the change block tracking active. So when you when you select the change block tracking active, um, he he enables the function on the ESX server and does a yeah let me say a block level backup from from your virtual systems. And the next thing what he can do is when you start the incremental backup, he only makes a backup of the changed blocks. Okay, this is a very cool feature. In case um, you write the VMs here to an NFS share with this function, you can mount the virtual machines directly out of the of the data store from the Sepsism server. Okay, yeah, and um, I added. Uh, let me say, yeah, this is a standalone ESX server. It looks a little different because you will not see a Windows environment when we browse into this box. Takes just a couple of seconds. Lenai, is there another question meanwhile? There is. Let me see here. Um, quick and easy one. Uh, does the Windows workstation need to have an SCP client installed on it to be able to back it up? And the answer is yes, you would have to uh, put a client on the Windows workstation um, to be able to back it up and also for the disaster recovery module. Um, unless it was in a virtual environment and you had, you know, some of the virtual licensing, so for the VMware or the Citrix or the Hyper-V, um, in that case it would just be an image level backup. Um, otherwise, yes, anything physical you would need to put a, a client license or an agent on. Yeah, perfect. Um, back to the question of one of our guests, can we select the disks of the VM? Yes, we can. Um, this is a Windows 7 box with only a C partition, but in case there are also a D partition and an F partition, you will see here for each partition a uh, own VNDK file. So you can select um, from which um, disk you want to do a snapshot. And when you know, for example, that um, the, the D drive is a raw partition, then it Deselect this uh, raw partition and make the backup through the, the agent what is installed inside the VM. Okay? So, again, here he prepares everything automatically for you. I just uh, choose a different um, task name and go back to my backup groups, add the backup group VMs, and put my virtual, my virtual guests in here. So now I have three different task groups, and the last thing I really have to do is add schedules. Okay, um, here you see some yeah default prepared schedules. Just let me delete them very quick. So and start with a schedule called um, let's say um, daily daily um, file ink to disk. Okay, crazy name, but it tells me what this job does. And I say this schedule should run from Monday to Friday. Um, I don't know, let's say 8 p.m. Yeah, it's 8 p.m. with a duration of six hours. The duration is how long he tries to start the schedule. Okay, and then at another schedule which says um, weekly file full 
disk and I choose the Saturday just any time it doesn't matter okay and um, what I can do now is select the schedule say new backup event and here I can say below the schedule I will add a task group with incremental backup mode hot of course because we we are able to do everything online on the media pool um, do we have a daily media pool not now but in case we have a daily media pool and we can select this pool here and select the task group file you remember these are the three task groups we added a second before okay below the schedule full I go again into the step this time I select the backup type full on my weekly backup and again the task group file so Sepsism knows that every task which is below the group file he has to start in the backup type full so that makes it very easy for you okay and um, you can do the same here for for VMs just say um, um, daily VM to tape for example select Monday to Friday on any time let's say again 8 and that is better for the overview um, write, write it directly in this in the name of the schedule here do a right click new backup event say backup type full to your tape pool week and select the task group VMs that's everything okay so and um, the only thing what you have to do when your environment grows up is to add this new system as a client here add tasks to the client and put the new task into your task group and that's all because the schedules are already prepared the groups below the schedule is still there and this is pretty easy and the last function I will show you is the migration a migration is to write something from one media pool to another media pool or also uh, in case of a technology change um, if you know for example that the DLT technology um, will maybe only exist for one year and you have to transfer all your old backups to a tape technology like LTO five the only thing you have to do is add two different media pools um, you know the DLD the the media pool which runs on your DLT drive is maybe the tape monthly and then you can um, just create a new media pool called LTO5 on test drives then you can jump here to migration and select yeah, new migration task and the name is I don't know um, DLT to LTO5 your source pool is your tape pool weekly okay with any drive and the destination pool is LTO5 and then you can say um, when I start this job I want to migrate everything only from today or from yesterday till today or from I don't know last year Christmas to the day after okay and um, yeah this, this is great um, the the real function is to say migrate data from your disk to tape so you run the backup to disk during the night and over the day you can migrate everything to a tape I select here my data pool this is my disk storage and um, I migrate it to my LTO5 okay very easy and yesterday yesterday to today all backup types I save it add a new schedule call this schedule daily migration let's say daily every day or every hour every minute starts at 9 a.m in the morning right click new migration task event and here I can select my migration what I did before and 
click on OK. That's it. So this schedule runs now every day, a backup to disk, and the migration migrated to tape. And this is kind of a perfect backup concept. You can add, you know, yearly backup tasks to that. You can run, for example, when you have a database and it's important for you to have the exact state of every hour, you can run log file backups every hour. You can run a log file backup every minute uh, in case you run an exchange server or a group wise environment. You can also run incremental backups every five minutes. But all that depends on, you know, the configuration of your environment and the performance. And um, what I also want to tell you is here in my second environment, NetApp. It's a new tool, a new feature, um, and it's, it's very easy. The only thing what you have to do is to add a new client with the operating system NetApp, type in the, um, yeah, the, the right username and the password, and then when we select a new backup task, we see all the, um, oh, sorry. Um, maybe I did something wrong. This one is the right one. And here you can see all the visible LUNs on your NetApp. And the only thing you have to do is select the LUN, agree with OK, and when you start this backup, we run a NetApp snapshot, mount the NetApp snapshot, and do a backup of it. And this is very, very fast because um, if we mount this snapshot as an NFS share, and when you do a crosswire between your NetApp and the backup server, you you know um, you can you can use a performance like more than um, 500, 800 gigabytes power. And I think this is also an amazing functionality. Um, Hyper-V, pretty much the same as for ESX. Your backup task, browser system, and here. When I click on my Hyper-V environment, I see all my visible VMs, okay? Turned off, turned on, just select, agree with okay. It changed the backup type for you and you have a prepared backup task, okay? Another thing, Citrix, Citrix Send Server, new backup task, agent-free, very important to know. You don't have to install anything on the Xen server. You see all your VMs and also a host backup and a metadata backup is possible. This is very important in case the system disk of one of your ESX node crashes. Okay. Select the backup task, agree with OK, and choose a task name. Put all that in your existing task groups, and that's it. Yeah. Yo, I hope it was an interesting presentation for you, um, Lanai. I'm yes, ready. I think that was, think that was excellent, Christian. Um, I think it covered quite a few different topics. Uh, we do have quite a few questions, um, so we can go ahead and jump into that. Um, I know that we did run over a little bit on time, and thank you guys for staying with us. It looks like almost every single person who had locked in is, is still on with us, so thank you very much. Um, we are going to go through and answer some questions. I, before we start that, I do want to uh, just give you guys some contact information. I did put it in the chat in the GoToMeeting um, little console part. But if, if, if anybody has any questions, wants to follow up you know, on an individual basis, um, you can reach us at info at sepusa.com. Or you can call us at 303-449-0100. And once again, uh, if you guys want to write that down, it's info at scpusa.com. And also, you can reach us by phone, 303-449-0100. And uh, let's go ahead and jump into some of the questions that we've gotten. Um, okay. If multiple jobs are running using all tape drives and I need to do a restore, will the restore job automatically take priority and grab the resources it needs to do the restore? Um, this is something what you can what you can um, adjust in Sepsism. The default is that the restore starts after the backups, but when you give the restore task a higher priority, um, I can show you that here, because in each task you can change the priority here, and when the restore job has a higher priority than the backup task, um, uh, the restore job will drive first and then the backup jobs. Thank 
you, Christian. Okay. Uh, another question. Um, are there any security issues using Java since we have a Java-based console? Um, not so far I know. Um, because, um, as Lenai told you at the beginning, um, our, um, you know, we, we work in, in many bank accounts and in Germany you have to run like a special, a special um, test, security test before you can sell your product at the market and we, we never heard about security issues in our Java console. And another thing is what we have here <coughs> is we have a user security, so, um, when we go to user permissions, only users, you know, known users which you entered here have access to the Java. And I think the communication between the Java GUI and the SEP server is encrypted. Okay, but this is what I maybe have to, to ask the development team if this is important information for you. Perfect. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, and if there is any follow-up to that, please send us an email, let us know, we'll get back to you. Um, another question, um, do we do source-side deduplication? And that's a great question. Um, right now, we are doing destination-side deduplication, and in our next release, it will be source-side. So we, we do have source-side up and running in, I believe, kind of an alpha test environment. Um, it's not integrated into our product yet. It will be soon. And and that actually comes back to some of what Christian just talked about um, with the mandatory testing and security requirements that are required in Germany. Um, most of our, our code is written in Germany. Um, and so we actually have to pass a certification and, and review of how everything works. And we basically have to, you know, wait until the certifications are processed until we can have a new release for something like that. Um, and so it, it's, I guess you could kind of think of it similar to getting a building permit for your house. Um, you know, you have to wait until the electrical passes inspection, then you have to wait till plumbing pass passes. And so we can only go one step at a time with it. And so basically we're going through that certification process now. Um, so that should be available in our next release. Um, another question, um, basically saying, I, I see that Oracle can be backed up. Can you guys back up Sybase also? Um, and is that while the database is running, any concern of data corruption? So the answer for that is for Oracle, um, yeah, it's definitely online while it's running. Uh, there's no concern for data corruption whatsoever um, for any of our database modules. Um, they all work very well. They're very high performing, actually. And in the case of Sybase, um, it's not supported. Christian, did, I think that just got added to our roadmap a little while ago, didn't it? Or a couple yeah, days ago? It, it does. It, it, it does. And it, it, okay. it, um, honestly, it looks like we will have a Sybase module end of the year um, available. Okay. okay. And I think that's probably one of the only ones that's somewhat popular that we currently don't have a module for. Um, but yeah, it sounds like it should be done by the end of this year. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And, and of course we can also dump, you know, schedule the database to just dump and then we can back up that flat file and there shouldn't be any issues doing that either. Okay. Next question. Uh, does SCP track the location of tapes? off-site, in-loader, et cetera, et cetera, so that if it's needed for a restore, it will tell you where to find the tape. Um, and, and I think basically, Christian, it does tell you which tape it needs, although I'm not sure if it has a GPS on the tapes that it, uh, that it tracks. Yeah, them, but. <laughs> not, not a GPS, but um, what, what you have here, um, yeah, I'm sorry that I don't have a running tab environment here, but if you see um, um, this, this screen here, you have um, the first thing what you have are user comments. There you can write information like tape is at this place. The next thing what we do is um, 
when you when you put out the tape from the tape library, you can uh, enable here a manual write protection, which shows you a red signal. So this is what you should use when you you know when you put a tape outside your tape library. Just mark it red so that you know okay this tape is not a part of my inventory and when you start a restore before you can start the restore he tells you which tapes are needed for for all your data so um you you know you can go wherever you have to go grab the tapes put it into the tape library start an archive adjustment and then start the restore but Seth will tell you where the tapes are perfect um, next, next question. Um, can a task be scheduled based on the successful completion of another task? Um, there is no, no, no GUI functionality, but you can, what, what you can do is here, when, when you have a backup job, um, you can select here a pre and a post execution and there you can um, write one this is just one line because I told you everything what you can click here in the GUI you can also write in, in a command line interface so what you can do is you can say make a, a post execution which says after the backup job was successful was unsuccessful was with warnings you can just do anything else start another backup, start a restore of that, or maybe also migration. This is what you can do here with our pre and post interface. Perfect. Okay, next question. Um, it says one of our um, ISO requirements is to do a year-end backup and take it off site for seven years. Can retentions keep that long? And I believe, yeah, the answer is yeah. I mean, we can set up a retention period for whatever we'd like. And the other thing too that we can that we you know want to kind of discuss also is is this just a regular backup retention that you're looking for, or is it data that needs to be archived? Um, because we also have you know archive functionality where we can physically archive that data with warm technology so that it can't be altered or deleted or changed or modified or anything like that. So. Um, you know, that's definitely a discussion that, that I'd invite you to follow up with us on. Um, and hopefully that answers your question. Um, the next question um, is a follow-up to that, actually, and it says, um, is the retention, does the retention um, period remove that data after it's been met or not? And the answer is, um, you, you can set it up either way. So you can have it so that data is deleted after the retention period, or you can have it so that it will remain intact until it's just time for, you know, until there's not, no room and it gets overwritten. Um, so you can have it either way. You can either make it so it is deleted after that time or so that it's just available to be overwritten. Um, another question, do you guys have educational pricing? Um, and is installation included? Um, yes, we do have educational pricing. Uh, we also offer nonprofit pricing as well, and government pricing also, which are all a little bit separate. Um, and installation is not included. It's a professional service that we do provide. Uh, we're more than happy to work with you guys and and help you do the installation process. Um, or you can, you know, have us do the full installation for you. Uh, generally, the way we handle our installations are to um, kind of work work with you guys and, and tag team an installation. So we would kind of have a preliminary meeting. We, you know, strategize, figure out the best scenario for you and your specific environment. Um, we would, you know, make recommendations for, um, you know, different different components of your network and your environment and then we'd start out the installation we kind of show you how to you know do the basic things how to install different clients and then we really let you guys um, you know do some of that work also and and again we can set this up you know however people need it to be set up but typically speaking 
most most of our customers really like to be involved and they want to say, okay, show me how to do one or two. I'll go do it myself. I'll do the rest of them. And that kind of drills it in and they know how to install clients. They know how to do the scheduling. Um, and then on an ongoing basis, um, you know, that it kind of suffices as, as initial uh, training as well. So generally by the time an installation is complete, the user who has gone through and done the installation feels very comfortable, very confident with everything, um, and really feels like they can go in and, and you know, administer the, the software and, and do whatever they need to do, make any changes that need to be made with it. Um, I have another question which says, is asking um, which email, and, and I believe that's in reference to which email programs do we support. Um, I would have to get a full list, but I know the popular ones are um, Exchange GroupWise, Lotus Notes, um, Scalix, Zarafa, um, Open Exchange, I believe. What else am I missing, Christian? Yeah, Dovecut, Cyrus, um, and what was the other Unix? Um, um, I don't know. There is another one. Dovecut, Cyrus, and um, yeah, I, I've forgotten the last one because um, yeah. Uh, we, we, we support, support pretty much all of them. So if there's a specific question on anything, um, you know, if you want to know if we support a specific email application, uh, please let us know. Shoot us over an email. I'll get back to you or um, someone will get back to you with the proper response. Um, let's see what other questions we have. Okay. Um, Thank you, Jennifer, for the kind words. Um, so Jennifer says that she thinks the product is awesome and she's really happy that you found us. She was um, having some non-support issues with one of her previous solutions. So, Jennifer, thank you. Um, and, and please, please reach out to us, get in touch with us. We're, you know, we'd love to follow up with you, um, get a proof of concept installed for you, let you do some testing and stuff. So. Um, any other questions, uh, please shoot those over. Um, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. Um, Christian, was there anything else that you wanted to add before we uh, answer the last couple questions and, and wrap up? Um, yeah, there's one thing um, I've forgotten to show you is this is, this, is a, this is the actual ratio of our deduplication after one day. So we've written 25 gigs and we saved seven gigs, okay? And this is just the first day. And uh, interesting thing is you can see here, when you start the backup of an ESX host, a block level backup, which is pretty much only, you know, the written blocks, um, comes from 9.7 gigabyte down to six. And when you, um, when you start this backup for a second time, the same season only writes 700 megabytes. Okay. Yeah. This. <laughs> wow. That's uh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and one other thing I'll mention also um, is that we we are able to users are able to access any data that has been backed up. So with a lot of the other backup software out there, I kind of use the analogy of a bucket. So if you're filling up a bucket with water. Um, or you're doing a backup job, and if there's an error with the backup job, or um, you know the flow of water stops into the bucket, with most backup software, you can't access that data. You have to have a full, complete backup to be able to go in and access that data. So with our solution, if you get 90% of the way through a backup, you have access to that information. Um, and, and so you at least have something that you can, you know, access and, and you have some of your data secure instead of like some of the other solutions that just stop and you have to completely start from scratch. They basically just kick that bucket over and you don't have any of the water that was in there. Um, so, so that is one thing that, um, that I think is, is a little bit unique to our software and, and something that's very useful and, and helpful. Anything else, Christian? Uh, no, thank you. Um, okay. 
Nothing from my side. I say thank you. Okay, hold on. Oh, I'll listen to me. One more. Um, somebody was asking if we have a copy um, of this webinar or if it was recorded. And I believe it was being recorded, and I believe we will have access to that. Um, so we can actually send out an email to people who uh, registered for the webinar, and we'll get a link to you guys so that you can access the uh, recording. And we will. Uh, yeah, we'll send that link out to you guys so you'll have access to it. So good question. Um, and, and again, if anyone is here who would like to forward it on to any of their colleagues, um, you should have that information sent out to you um, sometime later today. Uh, give one last second for any last questions. Oh, here's a couple that just came in, actually. Um, okay, these are basic. Uh, they're not questions. False alarm. People just saying, hey, we, this looks really good. We like the software. This looks awesome. Uh, thank you. Keep up the good work. Um, one person says, yes, please send out that link. I'd like to share it with other techs um, or other tech directors nearby. Thank you for doing that. Um, hey, congratulations. This software looks good. I'd like to try it. Thank you very much. We would like you to also. Um, yeah, thanks for all the positive feedback, guys. This is this has been a great webinar. Um, thank all of you individually for taking the time out of your day to, to attend. I know that many of you are very busy, so we appreciate your time, um, and and we would love to uh, follow.